Preface of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Therese. For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. Why this book? We, whose duty it is to teach in the name of Christ, often find our greatest happiness in dealing with children. When our words fail to stir the cold hearts of indifferent adults, how often do we turn to the company of children? The innocence and freshness of children attract us, and we turn to them. But still within the little children's eyes seems something, something that replies, They, at least, are for me, surely for me. I turn me to them very wistfully. Sadly enough, even the children sometimes disappoint us. The child easily grows listless, tired, inattentive, and occasionally mischievous. The poet blames the guardian angel. But just as their young eyes grew sudden fair, with dawning answers there, their angel plucked them from me by the hair. While the soul of a child, once it is won, is loyal. To win such a soul is worth a contest, even with an angel. Therefore, I present this little book of talks to children, with the hope that these talks may help priests and teachers to win the attention and love of children for God. I even dare to hope that these talks will win the love of the angels for priests and teachers. Then, not only the children, but also their angels, will want to listen when they teach. GTP End of Preface Chapter One of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Reverend Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter One God's Secret. One day, three angels looked over the walls of heaven. They saw this beautiful world, and they wondered why God made the world so large. They decided to find out a few things about this world. First, the angels decided to count the stars. They knew that it was a mighty big job, but they began to count. Every night for weeks and weeks, the angels climbed the clouds and counted stars. Big stars, little stars, bright stars, twinkling stars. The angels counted them all. They were very careful because they did not want to miss a single star. At last, their work was finished. The angels had counted every star. And how many stars do you think they found? Well, the angels found 372,941 stars in the sky. Just as soon as the angels had counted the stars, they hurried back to heaven. They told God that they had counted 372,941 stars in the sky. God smiled at the angels. My friends, said God to the angels, I have placed thousands of stars in the sky. I alone know how many there are. You have tried to count my stars, but you have not counted them all. You must have skipped some of my stars. Of course, the angels were disappointed. They thought for a long, long time. Let's count the rivers of the world, said the youngest angel of the three. The other two angels thought that it was a fine idea. So, the angels began to count rivers. Oh, the angels found so many rivers. Why, they found rivers in every country of the world. They found long rivers and short rivers. They found green rivers, black rivers, red rivers, blue rivers, yellow rivers. They found rivers near the mountains, rivers in the country, rivers flowing through cities. And the angels counted every river they found. How many rivers did they find? Well, they found 17,387 rivers in this world. Now the angels thought that God would be happy to know how many rivers there are in this world. But when the angels told God, he only smiled. God told the angels that they had counted well, but they had not counted all the rivers in the world. Again, the angels were disappointed. After all their counting, they had the wrong number. The angels begged God to tell them the right number of rivers in the world. But God only smiled. 
finally the angels decided to count the people in the world they decided to be very careful and skip no one well they were very careful they were very very careful the angels visited every city and every town they visited every country every land every island they went to india africa china yes they went everywhere the angels counted white people black people red people brown people and yellow people they tried not to skip a single person old people young people boys and girls little babies all were placed on the angels lists well when the angels had added their lists they had counted one billion two hundred fifty four million six hundred forty five thousand three hundred and twenty four people living on this earth when the angels hurried back to god they told god that they had counted all the people on this earth when god heard the number he laughed yes said god and there are many more people on the earth did you forget to count the old man who lives on the mountain in asia did you meet the little girl who lives in the cellar in chicago what about the man and his wife who live in a barn in georgia did you count them no my friends you have not counted all the people who live on the earth the angels were sad and disappointed they wondered that god knew so much as the angels turned away god smiled and god kept the secret yes children god has a secret it's a mighty big secret too god knows all things god alone knows how many stars are in the sky because he made the stars god knows the number of rivers because he made the rivers god knows the number of people in this world because he made every person in this world god knows where the stars are even when they hide behind the clouds god knows where the rivers are even though they run behind the mountains yes and god knows you god knows where you are every minute of the day god knows your name the color of your hair and the color of your eyes where you live how tall you are how old you are how good you are how bad you are god knows everything god knows everything about everybody god never sleeps he is always watching you you can never never hide from god you can never do anything behind god's back everything you do you do before the eyes of god and the eyes of god are never shut end of chapter one chapter two of for heaven's sake little talks to little folks by rev gerald t brennan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese chapter two the voice at the window if you were to move into a new house what is the first thing that you would do i wonder whether you would do what little eddie brown did who was eddie brown well here's eddie brown's story the brown family lived in the city they had lived in the city for a long time but mr brown didn't like the city mr brown was tired of the city he wanted to live in the country so mr brown bought a home in the country the brown family decided to move now little seven-year-old eddie brown was very excited little eddie knew that he would like the country there would be plenty of sunshine in the country there would be plenty of room to play games there would be horses cows and chickens oh eddie expected to have lots of fun little eddie could hardly wait until the family would move to their new home in the country moving day finally came eddie and the family said good-bye to the city they were on their way on their way to their new home in the country well the family rode and rode and rode at long last the auto stopped in front of a large white house yes the large white house was to be their new home in the country the father the mother and the two girls went first to the kitchen but little eddie brown didn't go to the kitchen oh no little eddie went upstairs eddie went from one room to the other he opened every door he seemed to be looking for something well eddie finally found what he wanted stairs stairs leading up to the attic eddie climbed every stair and found himself at the top of the house eddie was in the attic now there were six windows in the attic three on each side of the house 
Eddie walked over to one of the windows. He lifted the window, stuck out his head, looked up at the sky, and waved his hand. Look, God, said Eddie, we live here now. Now, you may think that that was a strange thing for Eddie to do. Well, it was strange. But do you know why Eddie climbed to the top of the house? Why, Eddie wanted to get near God. Eddie wanted to be sure that God would hear him. Eddie wanted God to know just where he lived. Eddie wanted God to watch over him in the country, just as he had watched over him in the city. Of course, you boys and girls know that Eddie didn't have to make that trip to the attic. You know that God is everywhere. God is not only in the sky, but God is also down on this earth. God is in the city, and God is in the country. God is in China, Africa, Australia. God is all over America. God is in your home, in your school, on the street, on the playground. God is in our church. No matter where you go, God is there, too. God is everywhere. Do you know what I liked about Eddie Brown? Eddie's first thought in his new home was about God. God was first with Eddie. I wonder whether God comes first with you. Do you get up with God in the morning and say your prayers? Do you talk to God before you eat? Before you study, before you begin your work in school, do you talk first to God? When things go wrong, do you ask God to help you? Do you go to God before you jump into bed at night? If you don't do these things, boys and girls, then God does not come first with you. Don't let that happen. Remember, God is everywhere. Make God your companion. If God is with you, you will not fail. If God is with you, you will never make a mistake. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Reverend Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Three The Three Frogs. How would you like to hear a story about three frogs? Well, there were three frogs, two big bullfrogs, and a young fellow named Pee Wee. It was a warm day, a very warm day, so the three frogs decided to go swimming. They hopped down to a lake, and in a short time they were having lots of fun in the water. The three frogs swam, they dove, they floated on their backs. It was a great way to spend a summer day, and the frogs liked it. After their swim, the frogs started for home. They were hungry, very, very hungry. Well, they came to a candy store. That was enough. The three frogs decided to treat themselves. You can imagine the surprise of the candy man when the three frogs walked into his store. But the three frogs didn't buy candy. Oh, no. When Pee Wee saw the ice cream sign, that gave him an idea. Let's get some ice cream, said Pee Wee to his friends. The bullfrogs agreed that it was a good idea. Well, the three frogs climbed upon chairs. Each frog ordered a banana split. The frogs wanted ice cream, and they wanted lots of it. All of a sudden, there was a terrible noise. Thunder, lightning. A storm was coming, and it was coming fast. Soon it began to rain. How it did rain! Things looked pretty bad for the three frogs. While the man was fixing the banana splits, one of the bullfrogs turned to Pee Wee. Pee Wee, he said, there's no need for the three of us to get wet. You're a fast runner. Why don't you run home and get an umbrella? Well, Pee Wee didn't like the idea. Pee Wee didn't want to go. Pee Wee didn't want to go out into the rain. Pee Wee wanted to eat his banana split. But one of the bullfrogs gave Pee Wee a push. Poor Pee Wee almost fell off his chair. Oh, all right, said Pee Wee finally. I'll go. I'll get the umbrella, but you fellows will have to promise me that you won't eat my banana split. Of course, the bullfrogs promised. The bullfrogs promised that they wouldn't eat Pee Wee's banana split. Pee Wee jumped off his chair. The bullfrogs began to eat their banana splits. Well, it rained and it rained and it rained, and the two bullfrogs waited and waited for Pee Wee to come back with the umbrella. 
Now Pee-wee didn't come back. But the bullfrogs waited and waited and waited. A whole week passed by. Two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks passed by. The bullfrogs were still waiting for Pee-wee. But Pee-wee didn't come back. During all this time, Pee-wee's banana split became smaller and smaller. Yes, the ice cream melted. In fact, Pee-wee's ice cream turned into milk. The bullfrogs shook their heads. They were disgusted. Oh, what's the use of waiting any longer? said one to the other. Come on, let's eat Pee-wee's banana split. Each of the bullfrogs took a spoon. They were just about to eat Pee-wee's banana split when they heard a voice, a voice near the door. It was Pee-wee's voice. Look out there, called Pee-wee. You had better be careful. Remember, fellows, if you eat my banana split, I won't go for that umbrella. Pee-wee's trouble was that he never got started. Pee-wee meant all right. Pee-wee wanted to do the right thing, but he just never got started. Yes, and there are boys and girls who are just like Pee-wee. Some boys and girls never get started. They are always going to be good tomorrow. They are always going to save their souls tomorrow. But tomorrow never comes. Maybe you have a bad habit. You know that you should get rid of the bad habit. But what do you do? Oh, I know what you do. You keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. Yes, you are just like Pee-wee. You wait, and you wait, and you wait. You never get started. Oh, there are so many good things that we'd like to do. We'd like to say our prayers every day. We'd like to stop stealing. We'd like to be honest. We'd like to receive Holy Communion every Sunday. But what do we do? Oh, we just wait and wait. We never get started. We always have some excuse. Remember, boys and girls, you don't know how many chances God will give you. You don't know how long you'll live on this earth. Now is the time to save your soul. Now, now, now. Do those good things that you want to do before it's too late. Say those prayers today. Stop that stealing today. Be honest today. Quit that bad habit today. Receive that Holy Communion next Sunday. Don't be like Pee-wee. Get started. End of chapter 3、Chapter 4 of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Chapter Four, A Little Child Shall Lead. This morning I'm going to tell you a true story. After all, true stories are always best. Isn't that right? Sit up straight now and listen. You have all heard about Notre Dame. You have heard about the famous Notre Dame football teams. You have heard about Newt Rockney, the great coach of the Notre Dame football teams. Well, this story took place at Notre Dame. In one of the chapels at Notre Dame. It was First Communion Day at Notre Dame. Several small boys, dressed in white, knelt in the front seats of the chapel. The boys had made their first confessions. In a short time, the boys would receive their first Holy Communions. Jesus would come to the boys for the first time. The time came for the boys to go to the altar. The organ played, and the choir sang, O、oh、Lord, I am not worthy. The boys arose. They joined their hands. They left their seats. Two by two, the boys walked up the aisle on their way to the altar rail. Every boy except the last boy had a partner. The last boy walked alone. As the last boy walked up the aisle alone, a man left his seat and walked with the boy. It was the boy's father. Of course, everybody knew that the father was not a Catholic. Everybody knew that the father couldn't receive Holy Communion. Now, when the boy noticed his father at his side, he turned and whispered, Daddy, go back to your seat. Please sit down. 
You can't go along with me. The father smiled. It's all right, Junior. Don't worry. It's all right. Well, the procession made its way up the aisle. Junior knelt at the altar rail. His father knelt beside him. One by one, each little boy received Jesus for the first time. Junior should have been happy, but Junior was worried. Junior was worried about his daddy. Just before the priest placed Jesus on Junior's tongue, the little boy turned again to his father. Daddy, please, he begged. Go back to your seat. You can't receive Holy Communion. You're not a Catholic. The priest heard the little boy. The priest knew that the boy was worried. Don't worry, Junior, said the priest kindly. It's all right. I baptized your daddy last night. Yes, Junior and his daddy received their first communions together. But that isn't all. What was the name of the daddy in this story? Can anybody guess? Yes, that's right. It was Newt Rockney, the great football coach of Notre Dame. Newt Rockney had many happy days during his life, but the happiest day of Newt's life was the day when he and Junior received their first Holy Communions. Junior didn't know it, but it was his good example that led his father into the Catholic Church. When Mr. Rockney saw his little boy saying his prayers, going to Mass, getting ready for confession and First Holy Communion, why, he wanted to do the same things. Newt wanted to pray. Newt wanted to go to Mass. Newt wanted to go to confession. Newt wanted to receive Holy Communion. A little boy, by his good actions, led his father to Jesus. You too, boys and girls, can do the same thing. You too can lead other boys and girls to Jesus. How? By your good example. Remember, others are always watching you. If others see you going to Mass, they'll want to go to Mass too. If others see you going to confession, they'll want to go to confession too. If others see you receiving Holy Communion often, they too will receive Holy Communion often. That's what we call good example. You like to do what others do. Isn't that true? Well, others like to do what you do. Others follow your example. Be sure that you lead others to Jesus. You have often heard me say, Don't go to heaven alone. Take someone with you. Yes, take someone to heaven by your good example. If you show good example, you'll never walk alone. Someone will always want to be your partner. End of Chapter 4、Chapter 5 of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 5 The Little Devil with the Long Tail. Once upon a time, there was a little devil named Smur. This little devil was a fast thinker, a fast worker. He never tired. Every day from morning until night, Smur was on the job. His job was to tempt children, to lead boys and girls into sin. Like all little devils, Smur had a long tongue and a very long tail. One day, Smur hurried along the street. He was looking for work. Well, Smur found work in front of a large white house. It was here that Smur met little Bobby Nelson. Bobby was watching a pair of roller skates which had been left on the porch of the large white house. Bobby wanted those skates. He could have fun with those skates. Those skates would make him happy. But Bobby was afraid. Bobby was afraid to steal, and the devil knew it. Don't be afraid, said the little devil with the long tongue and the very long tail. Those are mighty fine skates. Why, they're just your size. Think of the fun you can have with those skates. No one is watching, Bobby. Now's your chance. Get those skates. Get those skates. The devil certainly tempted Bobby, and Bobby listened. Bobby decided to take a chance. But just as Bobby opened the gate, someone stepped on the devil's tail. And did the devil jump? Why, the devil screamed and hollered and cried. And what do you think? A guardian angel stood at Bobby's side. Now, if there was one thing that Smur didn't like, 
it was a guardian angel. So Smur walked away, sat under a tree, and rubbed his tail. Smur was angry. Smur hated that guardian angel. He hated the things that the angel was saying to Bobby Nelson. Bobby, said the angel, I came here to help you. Don't listen to that wicked devil. That devil is trying to get you into trouble. He's trying to lead you into sin. If you steal those skates, Bobby, you'll make a sin. Remember, Bobby, God will never forgive that sin until you return the skates. While the angel was talking, the little devil jumped up and down. He waved his arms. He shook his head. Don't you believe it! Don't you believe it! cried the devil at the top of his voice. But Bobby knew better. Bobby knew that an angel would never tell a lie. Bobby decided then and there that he would not steal the skates. Of course, that made the little devil very angry. Why, Smur was so angry that he flew off in a rage, while Bobby and the angel laughed and laughed and laughed. You all know that each one of you has a guardian angel, an angel whom God has sent to watch over you, an angel who helps you to be good. But what you don't know is that Satan also sends one of his bad angels, a little devil who follows you around, a little devil whose job is to lead you into sin. When you obey, when you are honest, when you speak the truth, when you say your prayers in the morning and at night, when you go to Mass, when you go to confession, when you receive our Lord in Holy Communion, when you do anything that is good, then you are listening to your guardian angel. Now, when you disobey your parents or your teachers, when you steal or cheat, when you tell lies, when you don't pray every day, when you don't go to Mass on Sunday, when you don't go to confession, when you don't receive Holy Communion often, when you do anything that is bad, then you are listening to your little devil. Boys and girls, it's up to you. If you want to save your soul, and I know that you do, then listen to your guardian angel. Your guardian angel always speaks the truth. Your guardian angel will keep you from sin. If you listen to your little devil and his lies, you will fall into sin. Take my advice. Listen to your guardian angel and watch out for that little devil with a long tongue and the very long tail. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Six The Last Flight. St. Christopher, you know, is the patron saint of travelers. When people travel, they pray to St. Christopher. They ask St. Christopher to watch over them on their journey. Some people carry a medal of St. Christopher in one of their pockets. Many people have a medal of St. Christopher in their automobile. Aviators or flyers have a medal of the saint in their airplanes. My story this morning is about Jerry Miller. Jerry was an aviator, a pilot. He was a flyer. Jerry had been a flyer for three years, and he had flown his plane hundreds of times. He had traveled thousands and thousands of miles. Jerry Miller knew that flying was a dangerous business, but Jerry Miller had a great devotion to St. Christopher. Jerry always carried a medal of St. Christopher in his plane. Before every flight, Jerry always said a prayer to St. Christopher. He prayed to the saint and asked the saint to protect him on his journey. Well, one day Jerry said his prayer to St. Christopher, climbed into his plane, and was off. As Jerry flew through the clouds, he often looked at his medal of St. Christopher. Jerry felt that St. Christopher was riding in the seat next to him. Jerry felt safe. After a while, Jerry thought that it would be fun to do some tricks. He decided to loop the loop. That took plenty of nerve, but Jerry had lots of nerve. Jerry took the chance. He looped the loop and everything went fine. Then Jerry looped the loop a second time. More fun, more excitement. But the third time that Jerry looped the loop, something happened. Something went wrong. The engine stopped. Jerry and his plane crashed to the ground. Yes, 
Jerry Miller was killed. But that's not the end of the story. When Jerry awoke, he was in heaven. And what do you think? One of the first persons whom Jerry met in heaven was his friend, St. Christopher. Why, St. Christopher, asked Jerry, what happened? I thought that you would always protect me. I figured that you always rode in the seat next to me. St. Christopher smiled. Jerry, said the saint, I always rode in the seat next to you. But on that last trip, when you began to do your tricks, when you started to loop the loop, I got out. Jerry Miller prayed to St. Christopher. He asked St. Christopher to protect him. Then what did he do? He walked right into danger. And that's just what you do very, very often. You pray to God, and you ask God to keep you good. Then what do you do? You walk right into danger. You go to a bad movie. You read a bad book. You look at bad pictures. Yes, you play with temptations. And then, before you know it, you fall into sin. Almighty God may be your best friend. God may even live in your soul. But just as soon as God sees that you like a temptation, when he sees that you want the devil in your soul, why, God gets out. God leaves your soul when the devil enters. Now I know that you don't want to fall into sin. Well, then you must fight every temptation. When the temptations come, pray. Pray and ask God to help you lick the devil. If you pray when the devil tempts you, God will stay right with you, and you won't fall into sin. Remember, boys and girls, temptations come when you least expect them. When temptations come, fight. Pray. End of chapter 6chapter 7 of for heaven's sake little talks to little folks by reverend gerald t brennan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese chapter 7 the world's best flag every country has a flag a flag that's loved and honored but for us there's one flag that's the best it's the world's best flag the stars and stripes, the red, white, and blue. You know, our flag is something more than a piece of cloth. Our flag means America. Those stars and stripes spell America. A hundred million people, happy homes, fathers, mothers, little children, friends, mountains, rivers, cities, farms. That's America. The best country in the world. And the best country in the world has the world's best flag, the stars and stripes, the red, white, and blue. Do you know why we have soldiers? Soldiers protect America. Soldiers protect our flag. Soldiers fight for our flag. Why soldiers even die for our flag? As long as American soldiers have the stars and stripes, they are not afraid to fight. Wherever our soldiers go, the flag goes before them. Never once has that flag been allowed to fall on the ground. The flag always flies high. As long as the flag flies, soldiers will fight. The flag leads our soldiers to victory. Boys and girls, you are all soldiers. You are soldiers in Christ's army. You're fighting every single day. Whom are you fighting? Why, you're fighting the devil, and the devil is fighting you. You're fighting sin. You know, the devil is always tempting you. The devil is trying to make you sin. You have to fight hard. You have to fight hard against the devil and his temptations. If you don't fight the devil and his temptations, then you'll fall into sin. Now, in your fight against the devil and his temptations, you all have a special flag. That flag is the cross. A flag that you should love and honor. A flag that should be always before you. That flag will always lead you to victory. There are no stars and stripes on your flag, but Jesus Christ is there. Jesus Christ, the greatest soldier of them all. Christ fought a hard battle, and Christ won his battle. Christ won the battle against sin. That's what the cross means to us. That's what your flag means to you. Remember, the cross is your flag in your battle against sin. When the devil tempts you, look up at the cross. 
think about christ on that cross ask christ to help you fight the temptation remember too that when you're fighting temptation you're fighting for christ as long as you keep your eye on the cross you'll never surrender to the devil you'll never let temptation lick you you'll never fall into sin do you know what happens when you give in to temptation well you turn your back on christ you let the cross fall you throw christ into the dust now a real soldier never does that no sir a real soldier fights and fights and fights that's what you have to do if you fight the temptation you don't sin it's up to you then to fight to fight temptation to fight sin so hold your flag up high keep your eye on that flag keep your eye on the cross fight end of chapter seven chapter eight of for heaven's sake little talks to little folks by rev gerald t brennan this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 8. Peter the Soldier Let me tell you a story about our blessed lady. Boys and girls used to tell this story long, long ago. Now this story is not a true story. It's only a fairy tale. Yet, I like this fairy tale about our blessed lady. It seems that one day a soldier knocked on the gates of heaven st peter hurried to answer the knock well young man said peter to the soldier what do you want i want to get into heaven answered the young man i'm peter the soldier you must know me because my name is the same as yours look at my medals why i've been a brave soldier i fought hard i even died for my country certainly i've won my way into heaven yes answered st peter you have a fine name you have fought well but that is not enough i shall have to look up your record st peter brought out a big book he read page after page everything that the soldier had ever done was written in that book as st peter read he shook his head the record was not good of course st peter couldn't let the soldier enter heaven st peter didn't like to send the soldier away what should he do well st peter called st michael and the saints talked and argued for a long time st peter tried to find some excuse to allow the soldier to enter heaven no no cried st michael at the top of his voice that soldier does not belong here don't you dare to open the gates then st peter called a meeting a meeting with st joseph st bridget st teresa and st patrick st peter pleaded and begged for his soldier friend but st joseph st bridget st teresa and st patrick would not listen it was decided that peter the soldier was not good enough for heaven that didn't stop st peter what do you suppose st peter did st peter called jesus st peter told jesus all about the soldier how brave he had been how hard he had fought how he had died for his country jesus listened to every word but just then there was a terrible noise twenty devils came running up the steps of heaven stop stop cried the twenty devils this soldier does not belong in heaven this soldier belongs to us well things looked mighty bad for peter the soldier but just then a beautiful lady appeared at the side of christ it was mary the blessed virgin mary mary held a big gold book which she gave to jesus jesus took the book there seemed to be hundreds of pages there was writing on every page jesus began to read well jesus read and read and read and then what do you think happened jesus turned and bowed to mary that was the signal mary took the key from saint peter and opened the gates then mary shook the soldier's hand and mary led peter the soldier into heaven were the devils mad you bet they were as they walked back to hell the devils mumbled and grumbled mary they said spoils everything she's always stealing our souls 
now what do you suppose was written in mary's big gold book well there were hail marys written on every page there were thousands and thousands of hail marys it seemed that every time peter the soldier had said a hail mary the blessed virgin mary had written it in her big gold book those hail marys opened the gates of heaven for peter the soldier now children that's the fairy tale about our blessed lady that boys and girls told long long ago of course if peter the soldier had had mortal sins on his soul even mary could not have helped him into heaven it's a good thing that peter the soldier had prayed so much to mary it's a good thing that peter had said those thousands and thousands of hail marys do you know what i think i think this story shows that the boys and girls who told this story loved our blessed lady and i'm sure too that our blessed lady helped all those boys and girls to get into heaven boys and girls i want you to love our blessed lady i want you to pray to mary every single day i want you to say lots of hail marys every day if you pray to mary every day mary will be your friend best of all mary will help you to get into heaven now i'm going to ask you to kneel down and say this prayer with me o oh mary my mother i want you to help me watch over me protect me and keep me from sin i love you mary with all my heart to show you i love you i promise to pray to you every single day god bless you children and don't forget your promise end of chapter eight chapter nine of for heaven's sake little talks to little folks by rev gerald t brennan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese chapter nine the soldier's greeting you have all seen pictures of the statue of liberty well the statue of liberty stands at the entrance to new york harbor miss liberty stands on a high platform and she can be seen for miles she holds a torch in her hand and she looks out across the sea travelers on the sea are always looking for miss liberty when travelers see the statue they know that they will soon be home miss liberty is always there to tell travelers that they are welcome in america some day you may cross the ocean when you come sailing home to america your heart will jump when you see the statue of liberty miss liberty's torch will light the way for you she will hold her torch high so that you won't get lost you'll look up at that statue and you'll thank miss liberty for showing you the way home now here's a true story there was a young colored soldier who sailed off to war for months and months the soldier fought in a strange land he was a brave soldier and he fought hard then came the day when the war was finished the young colored soldier left the strange land and started on his journey back to america for several days and nights the soldier sailed across the atlantic finally one morning the young colored soldier saw the statue of liberty in the distance oh he'd soon be home he could hardly wait the soldier was very happy after some time the soldier's boat sailed very close to the statue of liberty the soldier looked up at the statue of liberty he saw the torch of light leading the ship safely into port the colored soldier was so happy that he threw his hat into the air then he raised his arms and cried out at the top of his voice lady you can drop your torch now eyes home now that soldier felt that miss liberty had guided him safely miss liberty's torch had lighted the soldier's path across the ocean miss liberty's torch had shown the soldier the way home now boys and girls just as miss liberty shows travelers the way to america so too does the blessed virgin mary show us the way to heaven you know we too are travelers we are traveling to heaven and the blessed virgin mary lights up the way for us how does mary light up the way why the blessed virgin mary holds jesus in her arms jesus you know is the light of the world yes mary holds the light of the world 
Now, if we want to get to heaven, we must keep our eyes on Mary. If we go to Mary, we'll never get lost. Mary will lead us to heaven. That's why I want you to pray often to Mary. Pray to Mary every day. Learn to love Mary and show Mary that you love her by your prayers. You won't find any friend better than Mary. Mary will help you to save your soul. Mary will lead you to Jesus. Remember, children, it's a long road to heaven. It's a hard road to heaven. If you pray to Mary every day, then some day you'll be able to say to Mary, Thanks, Mary, for bringing me home. I'm home now, safe in heaven. End of chapter 9「Ten of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 10 The Most Beautiful Picture in the World. When you open a book, what's the first thing you do? I know, you look at the pictures. When you open the newspaper, the first thing you do is to look at the funnies. Yes, you look at the pictures. Why do boys and girls go to the movies? They go to the movies because they like the pictures. Well, I like pictures too. We all like pictures because every picture tells a story. Now, I'm not going to show you any pictures this morning, but I am going to tell you a story. This story is about a man who drew pictures. The man was an artist. He painted pictures. I suppose that I had better tell you the artist's name. Well, his name was Lloyd. Lloyd was an old man. For over forty years Lloyd had painted pictures. Pictures of trees, pictures of mountains, pictures of rivers, pictures of ladies, pictures of horses. Why Lloyd could paint anything? People came from all over the world to see and buy Lloyd's pictures. One day Lloyd decided that he would paint the most beautiful picture in the world. It would be Lloyd's last picture, because Lloyd knew that he had not long to live. Well, Lloyd thought about his picture for a long time. He planned his picture. He thought about his picture. He wanted his picture to be the most beautiful picture in the world. It was to be a picture of heaven, and, of course, a picture of heaven would have to be good. That's why Lloyd spent so much time planning his picture. After several months, Lloyd began to paint his picture of heaven. He took his time. He was very careful. Lloyd didn't want to make any mistakes. Lloyd wanted his picture to be the most beautiful picture in the world. Lloyd spent many months on his picture. He worked day and night. At last, the picture was finished. It was beautiful. A beautiful picture of heaven. In the center of the picture stood Jesus. Mary and Joseph stood at his side. There were angels in the picture. Popes, bishops, priests, nuns, doctors, lawyers, nurses, teachers, mothers, fathers, Indians, negroes, cowboys. Every person in the picture had a smile. Everyone seemed to be happy. The old painter was happy, too. His picture was finished. He had painted the most beautiful picture in the world. Lloyd was tired but happy. He went to bed and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, the old painter awoke. His room was a blaze of light. There was a stranger in the room, a stranger with a brush in his hand. The stranger was painting on Lloyd's picture. The old painter jumped out of his bed. Stop, stop, he cried. You are spoiling my picture. No, no, said the stranger softly. I am not spoiling your picture. You spoil the picture, and I am making it right. Don't you know, Lloyd, that there should be children in your picture? Why, heaven is filled with children, and children belong in your picture. The stranger smiled, and the painter smiled, too. But just then, Lloyd felt that he knew the stranger. Yes, he did know the stranger. Why, the stranger was Jesus. Yes, Lloyd was looking into the face of Jesus. Before Lloyd could say another word, Jesus disappeared. Lloyd was alone, alone with his picture. The old painter looked at his picture. There were children in the picture. Jesus had painted children in the picture. 
the picture had not been spoiled. In fact, the picture was more beautiful than ever. Of course, Lloyd was very happy. Jesus had helped with his beautiful picture. Jesus had helped Lloyd to paint the most beautiful picture in the world. Heaven is filled with children. Jesus said those words over 1,900 years ago, and that's just what Jesus said to the old painter. Heaven is for children. Heaven belongs to you. You belong in heaven close to Jesus and Mary and Joseph. You know, boys and girls, sometimes people think that children are not important. Well, that's wrong. Jesus doesn't think that way. Oh, no. Jesus thinks that boys and girls are mighty important. Jesus wants every single boy and girl in this world to go to heaven. Jesus wants you to go to heaven. Jesus wants you to save your soul. Remember, there is only one thing that can keep you out of heaven. That's mortal sin. That's why I am always telling you to keep away from sin. Keep away from mortal sin. Some day I hope to go to heaven. When I walk into heaven, I am going to see the most beautiful picture in the world. I hope that every one of you will be in that picture. I want to meet you in heaven. Jesus wants to meet you in heaven. Jesus wants you to be in the most beautiful picture in the world. You will be there, won't you? End of Chapter 10 Chapter 11 of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 11 Five Precious Diamonds If I were to tell you, boys and girls, that you are in danger of losing five precious diamonds, you would ask me, What diamonds? Why, we haven't any diamonds. Now, you may be surprised, but just the same, you do own some diamonds. Yes, each one of you owns five diamonds, the most beautiful and the most precious diamonds in the whole world. Now, I can see that you are very much surprised. Maybe you think that I'm trying to fool you. Well, I'm not. What are these five precious diamonds? How does it happen that you own five precious diamonds? Listen. One day, St. Teresa of Avila was saying her prayers. As Teresa prayed, she held a crucifix in her hand. Now and then, Teresa stopped her prayers and looked at the crucifix. She thought about Christ and how much he suffered. Then Teresa prayed some more. As Teresa prayed, she felt a tug on the crucifix. Someone was pulling the crucifix from Teresa's hand. Teresa looked up, and there stood Jesus. Yes, Jesus took the crucifix from Teresa's hand. Jesus said nothing. He held Teresa's crucifix in his hand and stared at the crucifix for a long time. Then Jesus returned the crucifix to Teresa. Teresa looked at the crucifix. Something wonderful had happened. Teresa looked at the nailed hands, the nailed feet, the wounded side of Jesus Christ. The five wounds of Jesus were no longer there. The five wounds of Jesus had disappeared from Teresa's crucifix. They were gone. In place of the five wounds were five beautiful stones, five precious diamonds. Never before had Teresa seen such precious diamonds. Yes, Jesus had changed his five wounds into five precious diamonds. Five precious diamonds, the most beautiful diamonds in the whole world. You know, boys and girls, how much Jesus suffered from his five wounds. Two in his hands, two in his feet, and one in his side. You know that Jesus suffered those wounds for you and for me. Those wounds were the price that Jesus had to pay for our sins. The price that Jesus had to pay for our souls. Jesus wants us to think of his five wounds as five precious diamonds, and I think that you know why. Let's suppose, boys and girls, that we could gather all the diamonds of the world and place them in one large bag. And let's suppose that we could place that large bag of diamonds before God. Do you know that that bag of diamonds would not be enough to pay God for our sins? Why, that bag of diamonds would not be enough to pay for one mortal sin. All the diamonds in this world could not buy our way into heaven. When Jesus suffered on the cross, Jesus bought our souls, and Jesus paid a mighty big price for our souls. 
Why, no one ever suffered as much as Jesus suffered from those five wounds. But Jesus was willing to suffer, because Jesus wanted our souls. Yes, Jesus bought and paid for our souls. Our souls belong to Jesus. Whenever the devil tries to make you sin, just think about those five wounds of Christ, those five precious diamonds. Keep away from mortal sin, and you'll never lose your five precious diamonds. End of chapter 11chapter 12 of for heaven's sake little talks to little folks by rev gerald t brennan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese chapter 12 white cloud let me tell you a story about a little indian girl her name was white cloud indians have funny names don't they well one day white cloud went into the woods to pick flowers she picked blue flowers white flowers red flowers yellow flowers and placed them all in her little basket when the basket was filled white cloud picked up the basket and turned around and what do you think there stood an ugly old witch of course white cloud was terribly afraid what do you want what do you want screamed white cloud at the top of her voice at first the old witch said nothing for a long time she stared hard at poor little white cloud then the ugly old witch put her hand in her pocket she took out a tiny button take this button said the wicked old witch and do not lose it press this button and whatever you wish will jump before you the button will be yours for three long years after three years you must return the button to me and then you will belong to me white cloud took the button and the ugly old witch disappeared into the woods well the first thing white cloud did was to try the button she squeezed the button and wished for a beautiful white pony sure enough a beautiful white pony stood before her of course white cloud was very happy as she rode home on her beautiful pony the little girl told her secret to no one she showed the button to no one for a long time white cloud was very happy Whenever she wanted anything, she squeezed the button and made a wish. Then right away she would have what she wanted. Time passed quickly. Well, the three years would soon be ended. White Cloud began to worry. Would the ugly old witch come back? Would the ugly old witch take her away? Poor little White Cloud was terribly afraid, afraid of the ugly old witch. Then White Cloud had an idea. She hurried into the woods, where no one would see her. She squeezed the button and made a wish. White Cloud wished for a giant, a tall giant, a strong giant, a kind giant, a giant who would protect her from the ugly old witch. White Cloud had hardly made her wish when a big giant stood before her. Maybe you think White Cloud was afraid, but she wasn't. She wasn't afraid because the giant was kind. The giant laughed hard when he heard about the ugly old witch, and he promised to protect White Cloud. Now the big giant and his six giant brothers lived in a large castle on the top of a mountain. Well, the big giant took White Cloud to his castle, and there she lived with the seven giants. White Cloud was very happy. She forgot all about the ugly old witch. But one day there was a knock on the castle door. It was the ugly old witch. Yes, the three years had ended. The witch had come to take White Cloud away. One of the giants opened the door. And what do you think? When the ugly old witch saw the seven giants protecting White Cloud, why, she never even asked for the Indian girl. The old witch screamed and yelled and hollered from fright. She ran down the mountain as fast as she could and disappeared in the woods. But that isn't the end of the story. White Cloud still lives in the castle with her seven friends. The giants protect her. They keep her from harm. And best of all, White Cloud still has her tiny button. She still makes wishes, and they still come true. Yes, White Cloud is very, very happy. Maybe you wish that you had seven giants to protect you. Well, boys and girls, 
you have something better than seven giants listen do you know that your soul is just like white cloud and the devil is like the ugly old witch why the devil tries to make you like him the devil promises nice things to you he makes sin look nice to you he even helps you to like sin he tries to make you sell your soul to him oh but you cannot be happy if you belong to the devil you need seven giants to protect you your seven giants are the seven sacraments the seven sacraments keep the devil away from your soul now the devil is afraid of the sacraments when you use the sacraments especially confession and holy communion the devil runs away from you yes the devil runs as fast as he can boys and girls jesus made the seven sacraments to help you to protect you to keep you from the devil if you use the sacraments often especially confession and holy communion you need never be afraid if you use the sacraments often then some day you too will live in a castle god's castle heaven in heaven you will be happy with god for ever and ever end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Reverend Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Thirteen A Boy's Letter. Long, long ago there lived in India a very wise king. His name was Casper, King Casper this morning i want to tell you a story about king casper it seems that when casper was a small boy he and his big brother did something very wrong casper's big brother owed a man ten dollars of course the man wanted his money but casper's brother had no money the man was angry and casper's brother was afraid so the big brother went to casper and asked casper what he should do Casper thought for a long time, and then he had an idea. Casper and his brother decided to steal the money from their father. Yes, the brothers stole the money from their father. They paid the ten dollars to the angry man. Casper and his big brother were very happy. They were happy because they had been so clever. Well, after a while, young Casper began to worry. Something inside of Casper kept telling him that he had done wrong. Casper knew that he had stolen. He knew that he had been a cheat. The more little Casper thought about what he had done, the more he worried. He was ashamed. My, how Casper worried. Why, he couldn't eat. He couldn't sleep. Casper promised himself that he would never steal again. Finally, Casper suffered so much that he decided to tell his father what he had done. He wondered whether his father would forgive him. Time and time again, little Casper tried to tell his father what he had done. Then he would lose his nerve. Casper was afraid. At last, Casper decided to write a letter to his father. In the letter, he told how he had stolen his father's money. He told his father that he had helped his brother to steal. Casper begged to be forgiven and said that he was sorry. Then the letter was handed to the father, who was sick in bed. When the sick father read the letter, he cried bitter tears. That made Casper feel bad. Casper couldn't bear to see his father cry. The boy fell on his knees by the side of the bed, and tears ran down his cheeks. Yes, Casper was really and truly sorry, and the father knew it. Don't cry, said the poor old man. I forgive you for everything. I forgive you because you are sorry. Young Casper thanked his father for being so kind. His father forgave his sin because he confessed and was sorry. Confession and sorrow won for Casper his father's forgiveness. Boys and girls, do you know that Casper's story is your story? Every time you do wrong, you sin against God, your father. Like Casper, you cannot be happy in sin. But Jesus doesn't want you to be unhappy. Jesus wants you to be happy. Do you know that Jesus has made it very easy for you to ask for forgiveness? 
Yes, Jesus has given you the sacrament of penance. When you have done wrong, you must do just what Casper did. You must go to confession and tell God, your Father, just what you have done. You must tell him everything. You must tell your sins, and you must be sorry. You must promise not to sin again. When you tell your sins in confession, and God sees that you are sorry, God forgives you right away. God forgives when you confess and are sorry. Children, Jesus made the sacrament of penance for you, to help you receive forgiveness from God your Father. Confess your sins to God. Be sorry. Then God will forgive you. End of chapter 13「of For Heaven's Sake – Little Talks to Little Folks – by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 14 – St. Peter Goes Shopping St. Peter, you know, is a very important person in heaven. Yes, St. Peter has a mighty important job. He has charge of the gates of heaven. It is St. Peter's job to let only good souls into heaven. St. Peter sends the bad souls down into hell. It seems that one day St. Peter talked to God, and St. Peter was very sad. St. Peter complained to God that only a few persons had entered heaven that day. He wondered what the matter was. Why, it's the devil, said God to St. Peter. The devil has been working very hard these days. He never gets tired. The devil is stealing our souls. That made St. Peter very angry. He said nothing more to God. He decided, however, to stop the devil from stealing souls from God. Now what do you think St. Peter did? Well, that night he filled his pockets with money. When no one was looking, St. Peter locked the gates of heaven and hurried down the steps. Yes, St. Peter left heaven. He went straight down to hell. St. Peter knocked on the door of hell. The door opened, and out walked the devil. Of course, the devil was terribly surprised. In fact, when the devil saw St. Peter, he was afraid. How would you like to make some money? asked St. Peter. Oh, I like it, smiled the devil, as he rubbed his hands. Then sell me your tools, said St. Peter boldly. Sell me the tools you use to keep people out of heaven. The devil scratched his head. He thought for a long, long time. Then he smiled. Well, St. Peter, answered the devil, if you can pay my price, I'll sell my tools. St. Peter emptied the money from his pockets. There were thousands and thousands of dollars. When the devil saw the money, he was very happy. One by one, St. Peter bought the devil's tools. Anger, pride, envy, jealousy, bad words, bad thoughts, lies, dishonesty. As St. Peter paid for each toll, he was happy. Of course, the devil was happy, too, because he was receiving thousands of dollars. All went well until they came to the last toll. St. Peter's money was gone. He had no more money for the last toll. St. Peter promised the devil that he would come back the next night with more money. But the devil laughed and shook his head. No, St. Peter, said the devil, this last toll cannot be bought. This toll is not for sale. I have stolen this toll from little boys and girls. The children call this toll sorrow. When I have this toll, I don't have to worry. When children don't have sorrow, I don't worry when they go to confession, because I know that right after confession they'll sin again, and that's what I want. I want children to sin, and if children sin, they won't go to heaven. Why, all the money in heaven, all the money on earth, cannot buy this toll from me. This toll is not for sale. The devil was right, boys and girls. It's mighty important that you have sorrow when you go to confession. In fact, being sorry for your sins is the most important part of confession. If you are really sorry, 
you'll show god that you are sorry by not making the same sins again telling your sins is not the important part of confession the important thing is to be sorry if you are not sorry god will not take the sins off your soul don't let the devil steal sorrow from you if you should happen to sin go to confession and tell god that you are sorry and mean it remember god will not take the sin off your soul unless you are sorry when you are really sorry then god knows that you will not sin again that's why god forgives you be sure boys and girls that you have real true honest to goodness sorrow every time you go to confession if you are sorry you will make a good confession End of chapter 14chapter 15 of for heaven's sake little talks to little folks by reverend gerald t brennan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese chapter 15 the open door in our story this morning we are going to meet jimmy martin jimmy martin 23 years old it was a cold winter night past midnight jimmy martin walked down a dark lonesome street at number one nineteen jimmy opened the gate and walked into the yard quietly he turned the knob of the side door of the house the door opened jimmy entered the house he tiptoed up the stairs he entered the room at the top of the stairs then jimmy flashed a light there was a bed in the room a table two chairs a dresser for a moment jimmy was afraid he walked quietly across the room no boys and girls jimmy martin was not a burglar oh no jimmy martin was just a lonesome boy for six long years jimmy had traveled far and wide now jimmy had come home jimmy martin had left home in a fit of anger jimmy felt that his father was too strict jimmy wanted to be free so jimmy ran away for six years jimmy martin traveled all over america it was fun to be free and jimmy liked it at first everything went fine for jimmy then came bad luck jimmy couldn't find work he had no friends he was tired of being alone he was a sad jimmy martin lonesome discouraged disappointed even though jimmy suffered he was proud he was too proud to go home well one day jimmy martin received a letter it was a short letter a letter of six words no name was signed to the letter but jimmy knew that the letter was from his father what did the letter say just six words the side door is always open the side door is always open the side door is always open those six words kept ringing in jimmy's ears day and night night and day jimmy martin heard those six words the side door is always open the side door is always open jimmy could stand it no longer he decided to go home it was a long trip home a hard trip but jimmy walked every step of the way somehow jimmy seemed to enjoy it he was going home home where the side door was always open yes jimmy found the side door open he found everything just as he had left it the bed the table the two chairs the dresser it was the happy jimmy martin who fell asleep in his own bed for the first time in six years the following morning jimmy awoke and was he surprised at the side of the bed stood jimmy's father jimmy was afraid terribly afraid at first the boy couldn't speak tears came to his eyes he was ashamed father father sobbed jimmy please forgive me i'm sorry sorry for everything mr martin fell on his knees he hugged his boy he kissed him yes jimmy said the father you are forgiven i know that you're sorry oh i'm so glad that you've come home 
I'm glad that you found the side door open. Boys and girls, have you ever been like Jimmy Martin? Have you ever felt that God, your father, was too strict with you? Have you ever run away from God? Perhaps fallen into sin? Mortal sin? Maybe you like sin. Maybe you like being away from God. But then, one day you realized that you had made a mistake. You wanted to go back to God. Did you need a letter from God? Oh, no. You knew that God always leaves the door open. You knew that you could go back to God at any time. What did you do? I know what you did. You went through the open door of the confessional. You knelt down at the feet of God your Father. You told God that you were sorry. Did God send you away? Never. Why, God put his arms around you. God told you that he loved you. God forgave you because you were sorry. Keep in mind, boys and girls, that God's door is always open. God is always ready to take you back. God will always forgive you. But you must be sorry. You may have one sin or a million sins, but you don't have to be afraid. Remember, God is a kind God. God loves you. If you are sorry, God will always forgive you. The biggest mistake that any boy or girl can make is to stay away from confession. If you fall into sin, go to confession. Nobody in sin should be afraid to come back to God. No matter how bad we have been, God always leaves the door open for us. God always leaves the door of the confessional open for us. God wants us to come back. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Reverend Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Sixteen Joseph and Nicodemus. Good Friday, the first Good Friday. That was the saddest day that this world has ever seen. On that first Good Friday, Jesus Christ hung on a cross. Jesus suffered for three long hours. Then Jesus bowed his head and died. After Jesus died on the cross, the Blessed Virgin Mary began to wonder, Who will take Jesus down from the cross? Will the soldiers leave Jesus hanging on the cross? Well, let me tell you what happened. There was a man by the name of Joseph, a good man a holy man, and a rich man. This Joseph had loved Jesus. He still loved Jesus. Well, when Joseph heard that Jesus had died, he went to Pilate. Pilate, you know, was a governor, and nobody could touch Jesus without Pilate's permission. Joseph begged Pilate to give him the body of Jesus, and Pilate said, Yes. Joseph hurried back to Calvary, where he met a man by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus offered to help. First, Joseph and Nicodemus removed the nails from the feet of Christ. Then they loosened the nails in the hands of Christ. They lifted the body of Christ very carefully from the cross and placed the body on the ground. Joseph and Nicodemus sprinkled the body with spices. Then they wrapped the body in a clean cloth. Where did the men bury Jesus? Of course Jesus had no grave of his own. Jesus was too poor to own a grave. But Joseph had a grave, a grave that he had built for himself. The grave was made of rock. There was a door on the grave, and inside the grave was a bench. Well, Joseph and Nicodemus placed the body of Jesus on the bench. They covered the face of Jesus with a cloth. They closed the door of Jesus' grave. Jesus was dead. Joseph and Nicodemus had buried Jesus. Don't you think that Joseph and Nicodemus were very kind to the dead body of Jesus? Yes, indeed. They handled the body very carefully. Nothing was too good for that body. They gave the dead body of Jesus the very best they had. Joseph and Nicodemus loved the dead body of Jesus. Here in our church, boys and girls, we have the body of Jesus. Not the dead body of Jesus, but the real body of Jesus the living body of Jesus Christ. 
yes the body of jesus is right here on our altar do you notice how clean we keep the altar notice how clean are the altar cloths our candlesticks our altar cards are the best that money can buy we want the very best for jesus we want a clean place for jesus a clean home for jesus we try to be like joseph and nicodemus we try our very best to honor the living body of jesus because we love the body of jesus now how about you when you receive the body of jesus in holy communion do you honor the body of jesus do you have jesus come into a clean home do you brush your clothes do you wash your face and your hands do you comb your hair if you're careless about the way you look then you're not respectful to jesus how about your soul when you receive the body of jesus be sure that your soul is always clean that means that there must be no sins on your soul jesus doesn't want to enter a dirty soul children try to be like joseph and nicodemus respect and honor the body of jesus when you receive jesus in holy communion let your body be clean above all let your soul be clean end of chapter 16chapter 17 of for heaven's sake little talks to little folks by reverend gerald t brennan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese chapter 17 the golden key whenever a great hero visits our city the mayor of our city usually gives him a key that key is called the key of the city now the key of the city is a very large key sometimes it's a golden key sometimes it's a silver key very often a bow of ribbon is tied to the key now don't think that the key of the city will open any doors oh no the key of the city is given to a hero as a sign of honor it tells the hero that he is welcome in the city if i were to give you the key of my house you would know right away that i wanted you to visit me often if i were to give you the key of my house you would know that you were my friend i wouldn't give the key of my house to a stranger neither would you give the key of your house to a stranger nobody would it just wouldn't be sensible now for our story rita marks and helen wright were good friends for years the girls had been very good friends they lived on the same street they played together as children they grew up together they went to school together all through grammar school and even into high school their vacations were spent together yes rita and helen were very good friends every christmas rita received a present from helen and every christmas rita gave a present to helen the same thing happened whenever each girl had a birthday well june the sixteenth was helen wright's birthday for several days helen wondered what present she would receive from rita would it be a book would it be a box of candy would it be perfume oh helen thought about many presents that she would like to receive helen could hardly wait for her birthday to come june the sixteenth came helen wright's birthday sure enough the mailman brought a small package for helen it was a birthday present from rita marks well it didn't take very long for helen wright to open that small package and was helen surprised what do you think was in the small package there was a small box helen opened the box and in the box she found a golden key for a moment helen was stunned she stared at the golden key and wondered then she read the card this golden key is the key to the door of my house this golden key opens the door of a friend please use it often rita marks boys and girls do you know that we have a golden key yes we have jesus christ has given us a golden key and that golden key is holy communion holy communion is the golden key that unlocks our hearts and allows jesus to enter 
yes every time we receive holy communion we unlock the door of our hearts and jesus comes to visit us now it isn't enough to let jesus visit us once a month jesus wants to visit us more often jesus our friend wants to visit us at least once a week yes jesus would like to visit us every day if we don't receive holy communion jesus can't visit us when we don't receive holy communion we lock the doors of our hearts on jesus jesus can't enter our hearts unless we receive him in holy communion unless we use our golden key if i were to ask you whether you love jesus you'd answer certainly we love jesus well if you love jesus why then do you stay away from him why don't you receive holy communion more often why don't you use your golden key why don't you open the door of your heart there is another thing children that we mustn't forget don't forget that holy communion is also the golden key to the great city of god heaven you remember that jesus promised that those who love holy communion will surely go to heaven you want to go to heaven certainly you do well you can't expect to get into heaven unless you receive holy communion often children jesus is knocking on the door of your heart open the door of your heart with your golden key receive jesus in holy communion end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of for heaven's sake little talks to little folks by rev gerald t brennan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese chapter eighteen the friendly king most kings boys and girls are not very friendly they're too busy to be friendly they don't have time to visit their people but the king of england is different the king of england is friendly and very kind he's a busy king too yet he finds time to visit his people why the king visits homes schools yes and even factories everybody calls the king of england the friendly king well one day an enemy country made war on england that made the king feel very bad the king knew that war would bring suffering to the people he loved of course the war did bring suffering the war brought plenty of suffering the people suffered for months and months and the king suffered too now don't think that the king of england spent those months in his palace oh no not the king of england the king spent much of his time with his soldiers he encouraged his soldiers he praised his soldiers the king also found time to visit his people especially the women and little children well one day the king went to visit ten-year-old carl howard and his mother of course the boy and his mother were excited when they saw the king and they were very happy too well the king visited with carl and his mother for a long time then the king asked the little boy a question after this war is over carl what would you like best carl looked at the king he waited a minute before he gave his answer well said carl after this war is over i'd like to be alive do you know boys and girls that you too are in a war yes you are fighting a war with the devil and the devil is fighting a war with you the devil is fighting to get your soul every day the devil tempts you he tries to lead you into sin the devil wants your soul as long as you will live on this earth the devil will fight you your war with the devil will never stop now you too have a king jesus is your king and jesus is a friendly king jesus doesn't spend his time in his palace in heaven oh no jesus loves you so much that he wants to be near you that's why jesus lives down on this earth jesus lives on our altars why whenever you wish you can visit with jesus your king every time you visit jesus in church he asked you this question after this war with the devil is over what would you like best oh i hope that your answer is the same as carl's i hope that you tell jesus your king that after this war with the devil is over you want to be alive 
that you want to live with him forever, forever in heaven. Now, I'm going to tell you how this can happen. If you want to live forever in heaven, just keep close to Jesus, your king. Show Jesus that you love him. Go to church and visit him often. Go to mass, not only on Sunday, but during the week. Above all, receive Jesus, your king, in holy communion. You need Jesus to help you in your war against the devil. Every time you receive Jesus in Holy Communion, Jesus gives you strength to fight hard. The more often you receive Jesus, the more easy becomes your war against the devil. With Jesus on your side, you can't lose. Don't try to fight the devil alone. Let Jesus help you. Jesus will help you if you receive him often in Holy Communion. You know, boys and girls, Jesus once made a grand promise. I think it is the best thing he ever promised us. Now, this is what Jesus promised. People who go to Holy Communion often will never lose their souls. People who go to Holy Communion often will live forever in heaven. I shall say it again so you will not forget. People who go to Holy Communion often will live forever in heaven with Jesus. End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Nineteen Jesus's Workshop. Did you ever watch anybody making candy? It's lots of fun, isn't it? Well, this morning I'm going to tell you about a friend of mine who makes and sells candy. Everybody calls my friend the Candy Man. The Candy Man loves children, and children love the Candy Man. Every afternoon on their way home from school, children stop at the candy store and buy their candy. Sometimes the Candy Man tells the children a story. Of course, that's what the children like. But there's something that the children like better. The children love to watch the candy man as he makes his candy. He mixes the chocolate, pours in nuts and raisins, and stirs the candy with a big wooden spoon. Oh, the candy man works very hard. Every day you'll find the candy man working in his shop. Every night about eight o'clock, the candy man closes his shop. Then he goes home. Where does the candy man live? Well, the candy man lives in a little room over the candy shop. He lives all alone. Nobody ever visits him at night. Of course, the candy man must be very lonesome, but he never complains. And that's how the candy man has lived for over forty years. He works in his shop all day. He spends his nights alone. All alone in his little room over the candy shop. Do you know, boys and girls, that the candy man is very much like Jesus? I suppose you wonder why. Well, I'll tell you. The altar is our church in Jesus' workshop. The little house on top of the altar is the little room where Jesus lives. Yes, Jesus lives upstairs over his workshop, just as the candy man lives upstairs over his candy shop. Every morning Jesus leaves his room, comes downstairs to the altar, and works where everyone can see him. Jesus works on the altar. Jesus works in the Mass. You can see Jesus as he works in the Mass. Everyone can see Jesus as he works in the Mass. Why, you can even hear Jesus talk while he works. You know, boys and girls, Jesus works very hard in the Mass. What does Jesus do? Well, Jesus honors God for us. Jesus thanks God for all of God's gifts. Jesus asks God to bless us. Jesus, too, pays God for our sins. Jesus does all this work for us in the Mass. Jesus does all this work on our altar. The altar is Jesus' workshop. After Mass, when his work is done, where does Jesus go? Why, Jesus leaves the altar, his workshop, and goes upstairs to his little house over the altar. Jesus lives all alone. Jesus lives upstairs over his workshop. Of course, you can stop and visit with Jesus at any time. Jesus is always at home. 
Jesus is always in his little house on the altar. Jesus is always happy to see little boys and girls. And Jesus is especially happy on Sunday mornings, when he sees little children at Mass. Jesus knows that you've come to watch him work, but you don't have to come to Mass only on Sunday mornings. Why, you can come to Mass any morning. You can't come to Mass too often. Come and watch Jesus as he works in the Mass. End of chapter 19「Twenty of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. The Slipperbox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Twenty The Priest of Times Square. Everybody loves a hero. We like to honor a brave man. We like to remember him. We don't forget him. Do you know that one of the heroes of the First World War was a priest? Yes, a priest, and his name was Father Duffy. Father Duffy was brave. He was every soldier's friend. Wherever the soldiers went, Father Duffy went with them. Rain, cold, mud, guns, bullets, and the roar of cannon could not keep Father Duffy away from his soldiers. No matter how great the danger, Father Duffy was right in the middle of the danger. He heard the soldiers' confessions, said Mass for the soldiers, gave them Holy Communion, and prepared them for heaven. Yes, Father Duffy was brave. He was the soldier's hero. He was the soldier's friend. Well, after the war, Father Duffy came home to New York City. Everybody in New York City knew him. Everybody loved him, because he was a great hero of the war. Well, in 1932, Father Duffy died. But that wasn't the end of Father Duffy. Oh, no! The people of New York City refused to forget Father Duffy. The people of New York City wanted Father Duffy to be always remembered. So, do you know what the people of New York City did? They built a statue. A statue of Father Duffy. And where do you think the people put the statue? Right in the center of New York City. In Times Square, the busiest place in New York City. Every day, thousands of people pass that statue. People may be in a hurry, but they always have time to look up at their hero, Father Duffy. People call Father Duffy the priest of Times Square. As long as that statue will stand, Father Duffy will not be forgotten. The priest of Times Square will always be remembered. Boys and girls, Jesus Christ is our hero. Why? Because Jesus did so much for us. Jesus suffered for us. Jesus died on a cross for us. By his death, Jesus opened the gates of heaven for us. Jesus, our hero, died over 1900 years ago, and Jesus has never been forgotten. No person on this earth today ever saw Jesus. No one ever knew Jesus. Yet, millions of people today love Jesus. Millions obey Jesus. They won't forget Jesus. How is it, then, that Jesus is still remembered? Jesus didn't leave a statue of himself. No, no. Jesus left something better than a statue. Jesus left himself. Jesus left himself in the Mass. Every morning Jesus is born again in the Mass. Every morning Jesus dies again in the Mass. In the Mass we have the same Jesus who was born in a stable, the same Jesus who died on a cross. Jesus really lives on our altar. Don't think that Jesus has left us. Don't think that Jesus is far away in the sky. Jesus is right here on the ground, in our church, on the altar, in the Mass. When Jesus was born, you and I were not at Bethlehem. We were not at the Last Supper. We didn't see Jesus die on the cross. Yet, every single day, all these things happen again. They happen on our altar. They happen in the Mass. Jesus knew that, after his death, people would need him. Jesus knew that people would be lonesome. That's why Jesus gave himself to us in the Mass. Jesus is very close to us in the Mass. He is right here where he can help us, where he can answer our prayers. Do you know the best prayer that you can say to God? No, it's not the Our Father. The best prayer, the very best prayer, the prayer that God likes most is the Mass. That's why you should go to Mass often. 
of course you go to mass every sunday but how often do you go to mass during the week going to mass you know is the best way to pray to god the best way to show god that you love him would you like to see jesus would you like to meet jesus would you like to say something to jesus would you like to tell jesus that there is something that you want well you can do all these things when you go to mass End of chapter 20chapter 21 of for heaven's sake little talks to little folks by rev gerald t brennan this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese chapter 21 the first flower you have seen pictures of switzerland it's a beautiful country of high mountains and deep valleys well do you know that some of the people of switzerland live almost in the sky yes they do people really live on the top of the tall mountains they live very close to the clouds the people in one of these mountain towns have a very beautiful practice every spring the people have a contest everybody enters the contest and everybody tries to be the winner what do they do well everybody tries to find the first flower of spring whoever finds the first flower must pick the flower and he wins the contest the people believe that the winner of the contest will have good luck. That's why everybody tries to find the first flower. Wait until I tell you what happened one year. In the early spring, men, women, and children started out to find the first flower. For hours the people searched high and low, but they found no flower. They were about to give up when they heard a scream. It sounded like the voice of a child. It was the voice of a child. It was the voice of a little boy. Men, women, and children ran to the boy who was clapping his hands and jumping with joy. The little boy had found the first flower. But here is the sad part of the story. The first flower was growing down among the rocks on the side of the mountain. The boy couldn't reach the flower, and the mountain was steep. The boy wanted that flower more than anything in the world. The boy wanted to win the contest. The boy wanted the good luck. Everybody was kind. Everybody wanted to help. Five strong men brought a rope. The men decided that they would tie the rope around the boy, let the boy down the side of the mountain so that he could pick the flower, and then they would pull the boy to the top of the mountain. The boy looked down at the flower, the flower that he wanted so much, but he was afraid. The boy was afraid that the rope would break. If the rope should break, the boy would be killed. The boy was afraid to take a chance. No, no, cried the boy. I won't go down. I'm afraid. I'm afraid to take a chance. The people begged the boy to try for the flower. They showed him the strong rope. Not five, but fifteen strong men would hold the rope. Everybody said that the boy would be brought back safely. The boy stopped crying. He rubbed away his tears. Everybody wondered what the little boy would do. All right, spoke the boy. I'll go down. I'll go down if my father holds the rope. That little boy trusted nobody but his father. Fifteen men, fifteen strong men, wanted to hold the rope. Yet the boy was afraid. But that boy knew that he'd be safe if his father held the rope. Every day you and I are in a contest. We're trying to find the flower of good luck. We want good luck. We want blessings from God. We want health. We want to be happy. We want help with our work in school. We want to keep away from sin. Oh, there are so many things that we want. We want blessings for ourselves, for our fathers and mothers, for our friends. We want God to bless us. In other words, we want good luck. Oh, but many of us are not like the little boy in the story. We're not wise. We forget that God is our Father. We don't tie ourselves to God, our Father. We don't let God, our Father, hold the rope for us. Why, many of us rush out of the house, and we don't care or worry about how we're going to get back. We take chances. We drop out of God's sight. We slide down the mountain and fall into sin. We need God, and yet we don't call up to God for help. If we don't keep in touch with God, 
How can we expect God to help us? How can we expect to have good luck? Boys and girls, do you know how to keep in touch with God? By prayer. Prayer is the rope that ties you to God. If you fall into trouble and need God, all that you have to do is to pull the rope. Pray. If you pray, your Father in Heaven will take care of you. God will pull you out of trouble. As long as you are tied to God, you are safe. You are always safe when you pray. Remember, you need God every day. You need God many times during the day. Pray, then, every morning and every night. Pray during the day. Don't let go of that rope that ties you to God, your Father. Pray. End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of for heaven's sake little talks to little folks by rev gerald t brennan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese chapter twenty two aberdeen angus the other day i went for a ride through the country after riding for an hour i stopped to see a farmer friend of mine well i had a grand time the farmer showed me his farm his garden with all kinds of vegetables, his fruit trees, his field of wheat, his field of hay. Why, there was just about everything growing on that farm. Yes, and there were animals, too. Chickens, turkeys, ducks, rabbits, sheep, pigs, horses. It was a grand farm, and my farmer friend was quite proud of everything. After we had our supper, the farmer asked me a question. Father, how would you like to meet Everdeen Angus? Aberdeen Angus? I answered in surprise. Why, who is Aberdeen Angus? Oh, Aberdeen Angus is our famous cow, laughed the farmer. Aberdeen Angus. We call her Abby for short. Well, I didn't want to miss anything. Certainly I wanted to meet Aberdeen Angus. The farmer took me out to the barn. It was almost time for the animals to go to bed. In a stall in the corner of the barn stood Aberdeen Angus a lovely brown cow with a white nose and a sad face. "'This is Abby,' said the farmer, "'and she's a very good cow. Abby spends most of her time eating grass.' Abby shook her head. I think she knew just what the farmer was saying. "'Abby will be going to bed very soon,' said my farmer friend. "'Keep your eye on Abby and see what she does.' "'Well, I kept my eye on Abby.' I watched the cow for several minutes. She shook her head, switched her tail, and walked around the stall. Then what do you think Abby did? Abby knelt on her knees. Then she rolled over on her side, put her head on the stall, and went to sleep. Yes, Abby knelt on her knees before she went to sleep, but that isn't all. Do you know what my farmer friend told me? He said that when Abby wakes up in the morning, the first thing she does is to kneel on her knees. Then Abby stands up, shakes her tail, and goes out to eat grass. Just think, Abby kneels down the first thing in the morning and the last thing at night, and Abby is only a cow. Now, why does Everdeen kneel down the first thing in the morning and the last thing at night? The farmer told me that he thinks that Abby says her prayers. Well, I think so, too. I wonder how many of you boys and girls are like Everdeen. How many of you get down on your knees the first thing in the morning? How many of you get down on your knees before you go to bed at night? If you don't get down on your knees, then shame on you. I'll bet that, if Everdeen could talk, that's just what she say to you. Shame on you. If you will just get down on your knees every day, I know that you will pray. That's the right way to pray, on your knees. Do you know why you don't say your night prayers? Because you don't get down on your knees. You jump into bed, lie on your back, and... Before you know it, you fall asleep. Boys and girls, you can't pray on your back. You must pray on your knees. Get down on your knees. Aberdeen Angus. That's a funny name for a cow, isn't it? Well, Aberdeen Angus has taught us something this morning. Aberdeen has taught us to get down on our knees. Say your prayers every morning and every night. Get down on your knees. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of 
for heaven's sake little talks to little folks by rev gerald t brennan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese chapter twenty three the chicken and the sparrow this morning i am going to tell you about two strange friends one was a chicken the other was a sparrow Redcap was the name of the chicken, and Tipper was the name of the sparrow. Now, you may laugh at a chicken and a sparrow being friends, but just the same they were very good friends. How did the chicken and the sparrow become friends? Well, here's their story. The first time Tipper met Redcap, they were both in trouble. They were looking for a drink. Both wanted water, and they wanted it badly. For several days there had been no rain. The ground was dry, and it was terribly hot. The sparrow's throat was so dry that he could hardly talk. The chicken was so weak that he could hardly walk. Tipper and Redcap were suffering. They needed water. That's when Tipper and Redcap became friends. Well, all day long Redcap and Tipper searched for water. But there was no water to be found, not even a puddle. The friends were tired. They were weak. They were about to give up when Redcap had an idea. "'Let's ask God to send some rain,' said the chicken to his little friend. Tipper was too weak to answer. The poor little sparrow just hung his head. Now, I don't know how sparrows pray. I don't know whether they even say words. I don't know how chickens pray, either. But whatever they do, Tipper and Redcap did it. The sparrow prayed for rain. The chicken prayed, too. And what do you think? God heard those prayers. Yes, God heard the prayers of Tipper and Redcap. Did God send rain? Yes, God sent gallons of rain. For more than two hours it rained and it rained and it rained. There was water everywhere, plenty of water. Did Tipper and Redcap enjoy themselves? Oh, they had a grand time. Yes, the chicken and the sparrow had a grand time drinking water. When Tipper and Redcap had enough water, they raised their heads and looked up into the sky. Why did they do that? Well, I think that that was just their way of saying thanks to God for the rain. Anyway, ever since that day, all birds and chickens followed the example of Tipper and Redcap. Before a bird or chicken eats or drinks, he bows his head. After he has eaten or taken a drink, he raises his head to the sky. Birds and chickens seem to ask God to bless them before they eat or drink. They thank God after they have finished their meal. Now, boys and girls, what do you do? I wonder how many of you follow the good example of the birds and chickens. Do you bow your head and ask God to bless you before you sit down at table? Do you thank God when the meal is finished? Real Catholic children, you know, do both of these things. Real Catholic children pray before and after their meals. That's what you should do. Just think of the many children in this world who have no home, children with no parents, poor children, hungry children. Why, these children would give anything if they could have all the fine things that you have. You are lucky. You're mighty lucky. God has been very good to you. God has given you a home, parents, good clothes to wear, good things to eat. Don't forget to thank God for all these things. The best time to thank God is at mealtime. Before you eat, ask God to bless you. Ask God to keep on being good to you. After you have eaten, thank God for the many things that he has given to you. Pray before and after your meals. It's a mighty good practice. Don't you think so? Well, I do. End of chapter 23「Chapter 24 of For Heaven's Sake – Little Talks to Little Folks by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 24 God's Answer Many of you boys and girls think that God doesn't answer your prayers. Well, you're wrong. God does answer your prayers. God always answers your prayers. Let me tell you a Christmas story. It was the month of December, and little Jimmy Hogan was thinking about Christmas. Jimmy knew just what he wanted for Christmas. Jimmy wanted a bicycle, a red bicycle, a shining red bicycle that he had seen in a downtown store. 
Every day Jimmy thought about that red bicycle. Jimmy wanted that bicycle more than anything else in the world. So Jimmy decided to say some prayers. Every night when Jimmy said his prayers, he asked God to get that bicycle for him at Christmas. Now, Jimmy's mother was very poor. A bicycle, you know, costs lots of money. Mrs. Hogan didn't have money enough to buy the bicycle. Every night, Mrs. Hogan heard Jimmy praying for the red bicycle. And every night, Mrs. Hogan shook her head. The mother knew that Christmas would be a sad day for Jimmy. There would be no bicycle, and Jimmy would certainly be disappointed. Well, Christmas came, and Jimmy didn't get the red bicycle. On Christmas night, Jimmy knelt down to say his prayers. Jimmy, said his mother, I suppose you feel bad because you didn't get a bicycle for Christmas. I hope that you're not mad at God, because God didn't answer your prayers. Jimmy looked at his mother. No, mother, said the boy. I'm not mad at God. God answered my prayers. God said no. When you pray, boys and girls, God always listens, and God always answers your prayers. God may not answer your prayers the way you want Him to answer, but He answers just the same. Sometimes God answers right away. Sometimes God makes you wait. Sometimes God says yes. Many times God says no. God always gives some kind of an answer. You know, many times when you pray for something, God knows that that thing will not be good for you. That's when God says no. Then God may give you something better, something for which you never even asked. Just keep in mind that God knows what's good for you. God knows, too, what will harm you. God never makes a mistake. God answers your prayers by giving you what is best for you. So when you pray, leave the answer to God. God may say yes. God may say no. You will always get some kind of an answer to your prayers. Remember, God's answer is always the right answer. End of chapter 24「ンフォー」「フォーヘブンセイク」「リトルトークスツリトルフォークス」「バイ・レヴェン・ジェロル・ティ・ブレネン」「リスリブロックス・レコーディング」「イズ・イン・ザ・パブリック・ドメイン」「レコーディング・バイ・マリア・トゥリス」「チャプター25ザ・トゥ・ティアーズ」「ザ・マザーズ・オブ・チャイナ・テル・デル・チョルン・アヴェリ・ビューティフォー・ストーリー」Would you like to hear it? All right. Now sit up straight. Here's the story. It seemed that there were two tears, a big tear and a little tear. Well, one day the two tears went for a walk. They talked about many things, and finally the little tear asked a question. Tell me, asked the little tear, where did you come from? The big tear thought for a long time. He seemed very sad. Well, said the big tear, I'll tell you where I came from. I was shed by a little boy. A little boy lost his nickel. The boy felt so bad that he cried big tears. I'm one of those big tears. The little tear listened to the sad story. I suppose, said the little tear, that you like to know where I came from. Well, I'll tell you. I was shed by a little boy. I was shed by the little boy who found the lost nickel. When my little boy found that nickel, he bought ice cream for himself. The ice cream made him sick. The ice cream gave him pains in the stomach. Why, the pains hurt so much that the little boy cried little tears. I'm one of those little tears. As the two tears walked along, they couldn't help but wonder. One tear shed by a boy who lost a nickel. The other tear shed by a boy who found a nickel. Now, isn't that just like so many of us? No matter how much we have, we always want more. We're always shedding tears. We're never satisfied. We're always grumbling, complaining, finding fault. We always want something. We want this thing, or we want that thing. If we can't have a certain thing, we find fault. We find fault with our parents. Yes, we even find fault with God. We forget that every time we shed a tear because we can't have something, somebody else may be shedding a tear because he has the thing that we want. 
boys and girls are very often jealous of one another someone gets a new dress or a bicycle or a pair of skates then you want a new dress or a bicycle or a pair of skates you become jealous of the other girl or boy your jealousy makes you unhappy maybe the girl with a new dress or the boy with a bicycle and skates wants something that you have you may have something that someone else cannot have then what happens why someone else becomes jealous of you yes it's the old old story we always want something we're never satisfied we're always shedding tears we are never happy who was the happiest boy who ever lived it was the boy jesus jesus wasn't rich jesus was poor jesus didn't have fine clothes or a beautiful home there were many things that jesus couldn't have jesus had very little yet jesus was satisfied with what god gave him and jesus was happy very happy jesus knew that he had more than many other boys had so jesus was satisfied that's just the way you should feel take what god gives you and be satisfied remember your father and mother can't give you everything your parents haven't money enough to buy you everything they do the best they can to make you happy learn to be satisfied with what you have and thank god for everything you know boys and girls god divides things very well god knows what is best for you and god gives you just what is good for you so don't complain don't grumble don't find fault god loves you just as much as he loves the boy and girl next door remember that after all god is a good god isn't he End of chapter 25「twenty six of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks for Little Folks by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter twenty six Sparky and Rex. This morning I am going to tell you a true story. A story about a cat and a dog. It is a story that has a fine lesson for all of us sparky was the cat a large black and white cat well sparky lived in a firehouse where it was cozy and warm sparky's job was to keep mice out of the firehouse and she did a very good job the firemen liked sparky they petted her fed her often and gave her plenty of milk sparky liked the firemen and she liked the firehouse too sparky was very happy everything went fine until the day someone gave the fireman a dog a little brown puppy named rex well rex came to live at the firehouse of course the fireman made a great fuss over rex the fireman played with the dog gave him a bone and tied a red ribbon around his neck all this made sparky very angry sparky became very jealous after some time rex left the fireman and walked over to sparky howdy said the dog you've lived here a long time haven't you why you must know this place very well sparky didn't answer she just hissed and waved her tail oh come on begged rex we may just as well be friends sparky looked at rex with green eyes pup said sparky you've got a lot to learn just remember that i'm the boss around here I've kept mice away from this firehouse for a long time, and I don't need any help from you. So don't try to get too friendly. And by the way, don't you feel like a sissy with that red ribbon around your neck? I'm not a sissy, answered Rex, as he tore off the red ribbon and walked away. The little dog's feelings were hurt. He jumped up into the driver's seat of the fire engine and mumbled something to himself about a jealous cat. Oh, I guess I'll take a nap muttered sparky to himself as she walked slowly into the back room yes children sparky was jealous sparky was a jealous cat sparky didn't want rex to take her place sparky wanted the fireman to like her and nobody else sparky's jealousy made her very unhappy sparky's jealousy made her say mean things sparky's jealousy made her lose a friend why that's just what jealousy does to us 
Jealousy makes us think mean things. It makes us say mean things. It makes us lose our friends. Jealousy makes us very unhappy. You know, sometimes we're jealous of our brothers and sisters. Sometimes we're jealous of some boy or girl in school. What happens? Why, our jealousy makes us very unkind. Our jealousy makes us very unhappy. There is one thing that we must always remember. God made everybody, and God loves everybody. God wants you to love one another. Maybe some other boy or girl is smarter than you. Maybe someone has better clothes than you have. Maybe someone has more friends than you have. Maybe someone can do things better than you can do them. Well, why should these things make you unhappy? These things shouldn't make you jealous. That's the way God wants things. God gives different gifts to different people. God divides things, and God is always square. So, don't get the idea that God likes someone else better than he likes you. That isn't true. God loves everybody, and God wants you to love everybody. You want to be happy, don't you? Certainly you do. Well, then, be kind at all times. Be kind in your thoughts. Be kind in your words. Be kind in your actions. Above all, don't be jealous. Don't be a sparky. End of chapter 26「twenty seven of for heaven's sake little talks to little folks by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by Maria Therese chapter twenty seven double or nothing we all like babies we like to hold them we like to play with babies we like to watch them grow yes babies are lots of fun I guess everybody likes babies. Well, this story is about little Georgie Carson. Now, Georgie was not a baby. Oh, no. Georgie was a big fellow. Georgie was four years old. Well, anyway, Georgie had no brothers or sisters, and Georgie was lonesome. He wanted someone with whom he could play. What he really wanted was a baby brother. So, Georgie decided to do something about it. Now right next door to Georgie's house, there was a little baby boy. Every day Georgie went next door to visit the little baby. Gee, little Georgie would say to himself, I wish I owned that little baby. Wouldn't it be swell if I had that little baby for a brother? The more Georgie thought about that baby, the more Georgie wanted that baby to be his brother. Well, what do you think Georgie did? No. Georgie didn't try to steal the baby, but Georgie offered to buy the baby. Yes, Georgie asked the neighbor lady to sell him the baby. Of course, the baby's mother was only fooling, but she promised to sell the baby to Georgie for a dollar. Well, a dollar seemed a lot of money to little Georgie, but Georgie wanted that baby. So Georgie began to save his pennies. Every time anyone gave Georgie a penny, the little boy put the penny in his bank. A hundred pennies are certainly a lot of pennies. But Georgie saved and saved and saved. Georgie saved his pennies to buy the baby. Every day the neighbor lady would ask the little boy the same question. Well, Georgie, have you got your dollar yet? And every day little Georgie would have to answer, No. But one morning Georgie was unusually happy. The neighbor lady asked her daily question, Well, Georgie, have you got your dollar yet? Georgie smiled and shrugged his shoulders. Oh, I don't have to save my pennies any more, said the little boy, because I don't need your baby now. You know, God came to my house last night, and God left me two baby brothers. Isn't that swell? Yes, God was very good to little Georgie. I think I was very good to leave not one, but two baby brothers. I'll bet, too, that little Georgie was good to his baby brothers. Certainly, those two baby brothers made Georgie very happy. Babies make everybody happy, don't they? Yes, they certainly do. I wonder how many of you have a little baby at your house? How many of you have big brothers and sisters? Well, then, you should be very, very happy. 
that's just what god wants god wants you to be happy that's just the reason why god gave you brothers and sisters to make you happy do you know that some boys and girls are not happy with their brothers and sisters why some boys and girls quarrel with their brothers and sisters some boys and girls even fight with their brothers and sisters yes and they're mean to their brothers and sisters now that's no way to act you should always be kind to your brothers and sisters play with them share with them love them don't be unkind don't be mean don't be selfish if you're mean your brothers and sisters will be mean if you're kind your brothers and sisters will be kind why your brothers and sisters should be your very best friends you should love them with all your heart it's too bad that some homes are not happy homes i'm afraid that lots of homes are not happy because brothers and sisters don't love one another isn't that too bad yes it's too bad but just the same it's true i'm afraid that lots of times god is sorry that he gave you brothers and sisters you know god could have given your brothers and sisters to someone else if god had done that you would be very lonesome wouldn't you well then let's be kind at home let's be kind to our brothers and sisters let's love our brothers and sisters you will won't you end of chapter 27Chapter twenty eight of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Fix by Reverend Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter twenty eight The King with the Black Heart. Hundreds of years ago there lived a cruel and wicked king. He was a greedy king, a selfish king, a king who thought only about himself. This king was certainly well named. People called him the King with the Black Heart. Now the people over whom this king ruled were very poor, but that didn't bother the king. Oh no, the king made his people work very hard, and whatever money the people earned, they had to give that money to the king with the black heart. Day by day the people suffered, and day by day the king's pile of gold grew larger. More gold, more gold, more gold. That's what the king wanted. In fact, the king wanted the gold of the whole world. The more gold the king would have, the more powerful he would be. Well, after a while, the king had hundreds of pounds of gold. But never once did the king try to use his gold for a good purpose. Never once did the king give any of his gold to the poor. Never once did the king try to help the sick. The king had his gold. Nothing else mattered. Yes, the king with the black heart was a selfish, greedy king. But one day the king was taken sick. He wasn't able to leave his bed. The people were ordered to pray, but their prayers were not answered. The best doctors were called, but the doctors shook their heads. Day by day the king with the black heart became weaker and weaker. The wise men were puzzled. Everybody felt that soon the king would die. While some of the servants stood near the bed of the dying king, they wondered whether the king had some last wish. They asked the king a question. Tell us, asked the servants, is there anything that you need? The king could hardly answer. Yes, whispered the king, I need a friend. Now this is a very sad story. Yes, it is sad to see a king with hundreds of pounds of gold, and yet he is not able to buy the one thing in the world that he needs most. All the king's gold could not buy a friend. The king with the black heart died a lonely man, lonely because he was a greedy, selfish king. Now, there's a mighty fine lesson in that story. You know, boys and girls, God has told us that we must love him and that we must love our neighbors, too. That's where the king with the black heart made his big mistake. The king loved only himself. A selfish man loves nobody except himself. The selfish man doesn't love God, and he doesn't love his neighbor. He drives away God, and he drives away his friends. He has only himself. He lives for himself, and he ends up a lonely, lonely man. 
Children, don't be greedy. Don't be selfish. Love your brothers and sisters. Be kind and love your companions in school. The children who live on your street, your neighbors, your friends. Share with your companions and don't be selfish. Remember, when you love your companions, you are doing just what God wants you to do. God made every little boy and girl in this world. God made every little boy and girl because God loves them, and God wants you to love them, too. Don't forget, some day you may need a friend. You will never have any friends if you are greedy and selfish. End of chapter 28「Chapter twenty nine of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Reverend Gerald T. Brennan. The Slippervox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter twenty nine The Best and the Worst. A long time ago there lived in Persia an old king. The old king had one son, the young prince. When the old king would die, the young prince would become king. Now the old king loved his son very much, but the old king worried. Good kings, you know, must be very wise. The old king wondered whether the young prince would be a wise king. The young prince was good, but was he wise? The old king decided to find out, so he sent for the young prince. My son, said the old king to the young prince, I want you to go out into the world and find something for me. Find the best thing in the world and bring it back to me. Well, the young prince started out and searched a long time for the best thing in the world. The young prince searched everywhere and he saw many beautiful things. Gold, silver, diamonds, pearls, great books, mighty ships, beautiful horses. But the young prince would have none of these things. After months of searching, the young prince finally found what he thought was the best thing in the world. Placing the best thing in the world in a small box, the young prince hurried back to his father. The old king could hardly wait until he had opened the box. Now, what do you think the old king found in the box? My, what a surprise! In the little box, the old king found a man's tongue. A tongue like yours. Was this the best thing in the world? What is this that you have brought me? The old king asked in surprise. Why, this is the tongue of a very holy man, the young prince explained. Every day this tongue spoke many prayers to God. This tongue never spoke evil. This tongue never told a lie. This tongue always spoke kindly. It always spoke the truth. This tongue forgave enemies. Never did it move to be mean or hateful. This tongue never hurt God or man. This tongue is the best thing in the world. You have been very wise, my son, said the old king. You will be a wise king. The old king was very happy. The more the old king thought about the tongue, the more he believed that a good tongue is the best thing in the world. Well, several months passed. Once again the old king called the young prince to his side. My son, said the old king to the young prince, I wonder whether you can be wise a second time. Go out into the world again and find for me the worst thing in the world. The young prince hurried away. It didn't take very long to find the worst thing in the world. The young prince placed the worst thing in the world in a box and hurried back to his father. The old king was afraid to open the box. He wondered what was in the box. A snake? Perhaps a poisonous spider? Two of the old king's bravest soldiers offered to open the box. Now, what do you think was in the box? There was another tongue. Another tongue like yours. The old king stared in horror when he saw the worst thing in the world. This tongue is the worst thing in the world, the young prince told his father. This tongue never prayed. It has spoken evil. This tongue has spoken curses. This tongue has been bitter. It has told lies. Yes, and this tongue has hurt God. This tongue is the worst thing in the world. Yes, boys and girls, your tongue can be the best thing in the world. 
where your town can be the worst thing in the world. When God made you, one of the very best presents that God gave you was a tongue. God gave you a tongue so that you could talk to him, so that you could pray to him. God put four walls around your tongue and locked up your tongue with lips. God wanted to protect your tongue. God wanted to keep your tongue the best thing in the world. Sometimes boys and girls make sins with their tongues. They swear. They call God bad names. They say bad words. They tell lies. They talk back to their parents and teachers. How many times do children hurt people with their bitter words? Oh, too many times. Suppose that some day God should send an angel down to earth. Suppose that God should tell the angel to bring back to heaven the worst thing in the world. Wouldn't it be terrible if the angel asked for your tongue? Wouldn't it be terrible if the angel found that your tongue was the worst thing in the world? If God ever sends an angel for the best thing in the world, I hope that the angel will ask for your tongue. So keep your tongue clean. Let your tongue be the best thing in the world. End of chapter 29「30 of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 30 The Steaming Kettle. Some boys and girls don't like to obey. Maybe you are one of them. Perhaps you wonder why you have to obey. Well, that's just the reason why I'm going to tell you about little Jimmy Mitchell. Jimmy was four years old. He was small. Yes, but he liked to have his own way. Jimmy didn't like to obey. Well, it seems that one of Jimmy's favorite play spots was in the kitchen. He liked to be near his mother. He liked to watch her cook. Time and time again, Jimmy had been warned to keep away from the stove. But there was something on the stove that Jimmy liked. It was a tea kettle. Jimmy liked to watch the steam pour out from the mouth of the kettle. In fact, several times Jimmy tried to catch the steam in his hand, but his mother stopped him. Jimmy, Jimmy, his mother warned, never touch a steaming kettle. You'll burn yourself, and oh, how it will hurt. The boy heard his mother say those words many times, but Jimmy paid no attention. Jimmy was always trying to catch the steam. Well, one day Mrs. Mitchell was heating some water. The kettle began to boil. Steam poured from the mouth of the kettle. Jimmy moved close to the stove. His mother and father watched him. Let him alone, whispered the father to the mother. Well, Jimmy stood on his toes. He raised his hand. For just a moment, Jimmy held his finger in the path of the steam. That was enough. Jimmy screamed and cried and yelled. Jimmy had burned his finger. Well, you can bet that Jimmy never played with a steaming kettle again. Oh, no. Jimmy Mitchell had learned a lesson. It was Jimmy's first lesson in obedience. You know, boys and girls, Jimmy Mitchell was too young to know why he should have stayed away from that steaming kettle. But Jimmy's mother knew. Jimmy's mother knew that the steam would burn. That's why she warned him. But Jimmy wouldn't listen. Jimmy wouldn't obey. He disobeyed, and he burned his finger. Don't we act very often just like Jimmy Mitchell? Certainly we do. Our mothers and fathers tell us that we shouldn't do this or we shouldn't do that. Oh, we think that we know more than our fathers and mothers. We don't listen. We don't obey. Then what happens? Well, we get into trouble. And when we don't obey, we make a sin. Don't forget that God has sent your father and mother to watch over you. They take God's place. Your parents know what's good for you. They know what will harm you. That's why your parents tell you to do this and not do that. That's why you should obey them. You wouldn't disobey God, would you? Of course not. Well, God talks to you through your parents. When you obey your parents, you obey God. When you disobey your parents, you disobey God. Learn to obey. Then you will not get into trouble. You will not fall into sin. End of chapter 30 
Chapter thirty one of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Reverend Gerald T. Brennan. The Slipperbox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter thirty one The King and His Box of Gold. Yes, I have a story this morning a story about a king and his box of gold. King Maxim was a very rich king, one of the richest kings in the whole world. Now the king had two sons, Paul and John. Of course the king loved his two sons, and the two sons loved their father. But there was one thing that puzzled the king. The king wondered whether his two sons would always love him. Would his sons take care of him in his old age? Were his sons really honest in their love for him? Could his sons be trusted? Well, the king decided to find out whether his sons were honest. If both sons were found to be honest, then the king would give half of his money to each son. If only one son were honest, then that son would receive all the king's money. So here's what the king did. King Maxim decided to go on a long journey. Before he left, the king called Paul, the elder son, to his room. On the king's desk was a large wooden box. The king locked the box and gave the key to his son. Paul, said the king, this box is filled with gold. While I am away, guard this box well, so that it may be safe when I return. Then the king set out on his journey. For three long months King Maxim traveled far and wide, and for three long months Paul, the elder son, guarded the box of gold. When the king came home, the first thing he did was to open his wooden box. Not a thing had been touched. The king was happy. King Maxim knew that he had an honest son. King Maxim knew that Paul, his elder son, could be trusted. Now, that is only half of the story. Some time later, King Maxim decided to take another trip. This time, the king called John, the younger son, to his room. There on the king's desk was the same wooden box. The king locked the box and gave the key to his son. John, said the king, now it is your turn to guard my box of gold. Let no one open this box. Do not open it yourself. Guard this box well, and you shall make me very happy. And so the king set out on his second journey. But this time the king didn't stay away very long. After three weeks the king was back home again. Bring me my box of gold, was the king's first order to his son, John. John flew into a rage. He stamped his foot and yelled at the top of his voice, Your box of gold, your box of gold, why, there's no gold in that box. That box is filled with sand. The king said nothing. He merely hung his head. King Maxim knew that John had opened the wooden box. Then King Maxim became very sad. Why was he sad? Because King Maxim knew that John, his younger son, could not be trusted. I wonder whether you can always be trusted. I wonder whether you are always honest. Oh, I hope that answer is yes. If someone were watching you, you wouldn't be dishonest. You wouldn't steal, would you? Well, boys and girls, you are always being watched. You are never alone. Why, God sees everything you do. Your guardian angel sees everything you do. God and your guardian angel never have to set a trap for you. They never have to try to catch you. God and your guardian angel see everything. They know whether you are honest. They know whether you can be trusted. You know, children, Jesus hated cheaters. Jesus hated dishonest people. He hated people who told lies. Why, Jesus could have saved his life if he had been dishonest. If Jesus had told just one lie when he was on trial, he would have saved his life. But Jesus refused to be dishonest, and Jesus wants you to act the same way. Jesus wants you to be honest. Be honest when you talk and don't tell lies. Be honest when you play your games. Be honest in your examinations. Be honest at home. Be honest in school. Be honest with your friends. Be honest with everybody. You want people to trust you. Isn't that true? Well, people will trust you if you are honest. End of chapter 31
Little Talks to Little Folks by Reverend Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 32 Gabriel and the Cripples. We are going back over 1900 years for our story this morning. We are going to the city of Jerusalem, where Mark, a little boy who was crippled, lived with his father and mother. Mark wasn't able to walk. Other boys could run and jump and play games, but Mark could do none of these things. Mark spent all of his time in bed. Well, one afternoon little Mark had a visitor. An angel came to visit Mark. It was the angel Gabriel. At first, Mark was afraid. Mark had never seen an angel, and he wondered why this angel should visit him. Mark, spoke the angel, do you know that God loves you very much? That made Mark angry. He raised his head from his pillow. He pointed a finger at the angel. Don't you tell me that God loves me, cried Mark angrily. Don't talk to me about God. God doesn't love me. If God loves me, why does he make me suffer? Every day I have to suffer, but God never had to suffer. That makes me greater than God. Yes, I'm greater than God. Gabriel had never heard anyone talk like that. He dropped his head and left the room. Well, it didn't take the angel Gabriel very long to hurry back to heaven. Gabriel went immediately to God. The angel told God all about Mark and what Mark had said. Maybe you think that God was angry. Not at all. God just smiled. Then God promised Gabriel that he would take care of everything. Now, what do you think God did? Well, God left heaven. God came down to this earth. God lived here for thirty-three years. God's whole life on earth was a life of suffering. Why, God suffered more than any other person. But God never found fault. God never complained about his suffering. God wanted to show us how to suffer. Bad men nailed God to a cross. And finally, God died on the cross. Never once did God complain because he had to suffer. Never once did God find fault. But after his death, God went back to heaven, and God told the angel Gabriel how much he had suffered. Well, nineteen hundred years passed by, and once again the angel Gabriel left heaven and came to earth. This time the angel went to the city of Boston. When Gabriel was walking down the street, he met Michael Rogers. Michael was ten years old. He, too, was a cripple. He walked with crutches and was very sad. Don't be sad, said the angel Gabriel to the little boy. Don't you know that God loves you more than he loves other boys? Why, Michael, you are God's special friend. God is not my friend, snapped the little boy, and God doesn't love me either. But God has to suffer. If God loves me, why does he make me suffer? God never suffered as much as I suffer. You're wrong, Michael, spoke the angel kindly. Come with me. I want to show you something. The angel Gabriel led Michael to a nearby church. The angel and the boy walked down the aisle. They stopped before the altar. Then the angel Gabriel pointed to the cross above the altar. Little Michael looked at the cross for a long, long time. There was long silence. I was wrong, whispered Michael to the angel. God did suffer. God suffered more than I've had to suffer, and God never found fault. Then the little boy hung his head in shame. When he turned to the angel, the angel was gone. Michael Rogers had learned a lesson. And what was that lesson? It was just this. God wanted to be like us. God didn't want us to do anything that he hadn't done himself. God wanted to suffer. God came down to earth to teach us how to suffer. God wanted to teach us how to suffer without finding fault. You know, boys and girls, God suffered more than we will ever have to suffer. Never once did God complain. God never found fault. Sometime you may have to suffer. You may be sick. Your father or mother may die. Or you may be very poor. All these things will make you suffer. Just keep in mind that God suffered too. No matter how much you may have to suffer, you'll never have to suffer as much as God suffered. 
When suffering comes, don't think that God doesn't love you. God loves you more when you have to suffer. When you have to suffer, ask God to help you so that you won't complain. Ask God to use your sufferings as pay for all the sins of your life. Remember, suffering can buy your way out of purgatory. The more you suffer now, the less you will have to suffer in purgatory. Remember, children, if you find things hard, don't be angry with God. If you ever have to suffer, don't ever turn away from God. If you find things hard, if you have to suffer something, then go to Jesus. He suffered once. He knows how you feel. Jesus wants to help you. End of chapter 32「Chapter thirty three of For Heaven's Sake Little Talks to Little Folks by Reverend Gerald T. Brennan. The Slipperbox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter thirty three The Angel with the Horn. There is an angel in heaven who is very, very important. That angel is the angel Gabriel. It was the angel Gabriel who a long time ago came down from heaven and told the Blessed Virgin Mary that she was to be the mother of Jesus. Now, that was a very special job for the angel Gabriel. No wonder people always think of the angel Gabriel as one of God's most important angels. Well, the angel Gabriel is very important. Now, the angel Gabriel has another important job. Do you know that some day the angel Gabriel will blow a great big horn? Yes, a horn that will be heard all over the world. People in America, China, Africa, India, people all over the world will hear that horn. And when people hear Gabriel's horn, they will know right away that the end of the world has come. People say that one day God and the angel Gabriel looked down from heaven. They saw a strange sight. They saw men, women, and children on this earth making sins. They saw men, women, and children breaking God's laws. Of course, that made God very sad. God had made men, women, and children to love him. They were not loving him. They were making sins. No wonder God was sad. Oh, I am sorry that I made the world, said God to the angel Gabriel. Look at those people down there. See how they are sinning. Those people do not love me. When Gabriel saw that God was sad, he felt sorry for God. He began to think, what can I do to make God happy? Then Gabriel had an idea. I know what I'll do, said Gabriel to himself. I'll blow my horn. I'll put an end to this world. Then there'll be no more sin and God will be happy. Gabriel picked up his horn. He was just about to blow, but God stopped him. Stop, said God to Gabriel. You must not blow that horn. It is not time to blow that horn. You must not blow that horn until judgment day. Please, God, begged the angel. Please, let me blow my horn. I'll put an end to this world. I'll put an end to sin. God smiled. No, Gabriel, said God. You must not blow your horn until judgment day. Then Gabriel asked God a question. Tell me, asked the angel, which day will be judgment day? God refused to answer the angel's question. Then Gabriel decided to try again. You know, said the angel to God, judgment day will be a mighty big day for everybody. I want to play my best tune on judgment day. I'd like to know which day will be judgment day so that I can begin to practice. Judgment day will be a big day and I want to be ready. Gabriel, said God, you must always be ready. It is not important to know which day will be judgment day but it is important to be always ready. Boys and girls, some day the angel Gabriel will blow his horn. That will be the signal that the end of the world has come. Then, do you know what will happen? People who have been dead will live again. Everybody who has ever lived on this earth will meet in one place. God will be there, and God will judge us. God will show your soul to everybody, and he will show my soul to everybody. You will see my soul, and I'll see your soul. Everybody will know all the good things and all the bad things that we have ever done. Then God will pick out the good people to live with him forever in heaven. God will send the bad people to hell. 
God is the only one who knows which day will be judgment day. It may be today, it may be tomorrow. After all, boys and girls, it isn't important to know which day will be judgment day. The important thing is to be ready. So don't worry about when Angel Gabriel will blow his horn. All that you have to do is to be ready. Be ready every day. End of chapter 33「thirty four of for heaven's sake little talks to little folks by rev gerald t brennan the slippervox recording is in the public domain recording by maria Treese. chapter thirty four the grave stops perrot one of our favorite animals is the horse yes we all like a horse well i think that you're going to like the horse in my story this morning this horse's name is perrot and he lives in New York City. Let me tell you his story. When Perrot was a young horse, he was bought by the police department of New York City. Then Perrot was sent to school. No, Perrot didn't have to learn how to read or write, but Perrot had to learn how to walk, how to trot, how to turn around quickly, and how to act in a crowd. After thirty days of school, Perrot was placed on traffic duty. His rider was policeman Dan Fitzpatrick. Policeman Dan liked horses. Policeman Dan learned to love Perrot, and they became very good friends. Every day Policeman Dan went to the stable with a pocket full of sugar and carrots. As soon as Perrot heard the policeman's voice, he would stamp his feet and make a loud noise. After Perrot had eaten his sugar and carrots, Policeman Dan would saddle him, and off they would go on traffic duty. For ten long years, Perrot and Policeman Dan did a fine job on the streets of New York City. Summer and winter, warm days and cold days, rain or shine, Perrot and Policeman Dan were always on the job. But then, a very sad thing happened. One day, Policeman Dan didn't appear for work. Policeman Dan was sick, very sick. In fact, two days later, Policeman Dan Fitzpatrick died. Well, Policeman Dan had a large funeral. Fifty policemen on horseback rode in front of the coffin. Behind the coffin walked Perrot. A black net blanket covered the horse from head to tail. Perrot walked alone. His head was bowed. He seemed very sad. Perrot was without a rider. From the house to the church, and then from the church to the cemetery, Perrot followed his master. As the body of policeman Dan Fitzpatrick was lowered in the grave, the faithful Perrot stamped his foot. There seemed to be a tear in the horse's eye. I think Perrot understood. For ten long years, Perrot and policeman Dan had been very close friends. Perrot was loyal to his friend to the very end. The faithful horse followed his friend to the grave, but Perrot was stopped at the grave. That isn't true of us, boys and girls. No, sir. If one of our friends dies, we may follow our friend to the grave. But we don't have to say good-bye to our friend at the grave. Oh, no. They may put our friend's body in the grave, but that's not the end of our friend. No, no. Our friend's soul will never die. Our friend's soul, you know, will live forever. Now, before our friend's soul goes to heaven, it may have to go to purgatory. If there are any venial sins on that soul... Those venial sins must be removed by suffering and purgatory. Then, too, that soul must pay God for every sin that it has ever made. Yes, boys and girls, the poor souls in purgatory suffer. The poor souls can't help themselves. They can't help themselves by praying. They can't go to Mass. They can't receive Holy Communion. They can't do anything that will hurry them out of purgatory into heaven. But you can help. You can pray for the poor souls. You can offer your masses for the poor souls. You can receive Holy Communion for the poor souls. Yes, you can help the poor souls in many ways. You can shorten their time in purgatory. Maybe some poor soul needs just one Hail Mary to get into heaven. Why don't you say that Hail Mary this morning? Pray today. Pray every day for the poor souls. Oh, it's a grand thing to know that we can help our dead friends to get into heaven. We can help our dead friends, the poor souls, by our prayers, our masses, our holy communions. Perrot was loyal to the grave. Don't let the grave stop you. 
be loyal to your friends in purgatory pray for the poor souls end of chapter thirty four end of for heaven's sake little talks to little folks by reverend gerald t brennan